cure. There's no cure for this. So they consider it, a, if you can manage it, if you can get it into management, it's considered a chronic disease. And the thing is, is that most of us don't die of the quote unquote disease that we have. What we end up dying from is something stupid like the flu that turns into mm-hmm. pneumonia that we can't control. And then for someone like me, if that turns into pneumonia and we're not controlling that, it's really hard to keep the pemphigus vulgaris in control because your body is now stressed out. And all autoimmune diseases are primarily caused by stress, whether that's emotional stress or financial stress or nutritional stress or chemical stress. So like a kid, two twins in Australia, one ends up getting pemphigus vulgaris, the other one doesn't. He's 17 years old, and his mom is flipping out. And the only thing that was different was that the one kid took a job during the summer spraying Roundup and didn't wear protective gear. And he chemically stressed out his body, and he got sick with PV, and the other, and the other boy doesn't have it at all. He's got the, he's got the genetic makeup to, to trip it, you know, if, if he trips his, into an immune disease, he'll trip into PV because that's in his blood. But the other kid hasn't tripped it, you know. Um, so it's, it's how we live our lives and how we react to things, you know. And so you, if you have an extreme autoimmune disease, you have to learn how to respond to things instead of reacting. You have to learn how yep. to say no. So yep. four weeks ago, I was on, I started that trip, and I will get back to the the idea of what I have to look for if I'm looking for in a man. But uh, I started that trip, and 1,560 miles into it, 20 miles outside of the state of Wisconsin, and my niece's wedding <laughs> that I was actually shooting um, as a photographer. And as long as I'm saying that, I need to clarify with everything with the American Wedding Project. I am not your primary photographer anymore. I'm coming in just as a journalist. So I don't want to interrupt the economic flow of a wedding and take away an economic piece of the puzzle from a local business person. Um, Mm. I'm literally coming in just as an observer. I am the aunt that you guys forgot (laughs) you had, (laughs) you know. Um, So... So they don't have to worry about me not being there because I might die. You know what I mean? Um, so, but anyway, 1,560 miles into this trip, a car comes up behind me, and I hear the honking. So I look in my rear view mirrors, and I he- see the hands waving out the window, pointing to the right. And they come around me yelling, get over, you're on fire. And I'm like... And I heard it, and I was like, okay. <laughs> and, and instead of reacting like most people would do, I responded. You know, I literally, I pulled my bike over, I put the kickstand down, I got off, I turned it off, I, turned, I took the keys out, I walked around the back of the bike, yep, the muffler is on fire. I opened the trunk of the bike, I take my wallet, I whip that as far away as I can. I then take, I have an extra can of fuel that's in the, and it's in a fireproof thing, but, you know, you don't really want to test that, right? So I take that and I whip that as far as I can away from the bike, and I manage to take all of the rest of the stuff out of the trunk that I had in the trunk, and I didn't get burned until I went to take the keys. And I actually tried to dump a bottle of water. I had a bottle of water in the trunk, and I tried to dump that on on my gear, thinking maybe maybe I could get my gear off the bike yet, all my camping equipment and stuff. And uh, yeah, that was that was futile. And uh, and I and I uh, I grabbed the keys, which are now like hot, super hot metal. And so I ended up burning, having a couple of burns on my hands. And I didn't know that little pieces of things from the bike had fallen on my boots. And I didn't know that the inside, you can't see it on the outside of my biker boots, but on the inside, when you put your hand in them, you can feel where the, the inside, you know, like that fleece stuff, that, that fluffy stuff that's in your boots, 
it all melted. Right. And because I have a, I, my skin is very, very tender, and it doesn't heal easily. Um, yeah, my feet had huge blisters and burns on them on both feet where stuff had fallen on the boots. Um, so the boots are trash. <laughs> my, my very expensive biker boots are done. Um, but that's, that's, you know, that's life, right? And the, when, the, yeah. when the cop came, you know, he comes up to me and he's like, do you need to sit down? Do you need a bottle of water? Are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm okay. He goes, you're really calm. And I'm like, I, what, am I, what, what can I do about it? What am I, what am I going to do? My bike is burning. <laughs> you know, and I stood there for the bike burned almost a half an hour before the firemen got there. A couple of other guys, you know, stopped by with, with fire extinguishers. The one guy... It was kind of funny, you know, He, I think he wanted to save the day, but his fire extinguishers were outdated. <laughs> and he couldn't get them to work at all. So there's a there's something to keep in mind. If you have extinguishers in your truck and you don't check them every year, you might want to look at that, you know. Um, so the fire department finally came. They, you know, extinguished what was left of the bike. And I think if you've read the blog, you, you've seen – the picture on the bottom of the blog with the bike that's completely um, just black. Um, it's just the, the metal frame of the bike was left. Everything else melted upon the ground and all my camping gear and three quarters of my laundry. Uh, actually, three quarters of my clothing was, was in, the, in, in the bags on the bike because it was laundry. And that's kind of an interesting piece. That morning, I packed completely differently. This is why I say, you know, God kind of is in my life in a very strange way. I literally moved all of my electronic stuff and all of my extra medicine, you know, like, um, so I carry with me a bunch of, like, steroid cream and painkillers, stuff that I don't use every day, but that if I needed it, I had it with me. And I had been putting that in either the trunk or in a side bag because I didn't want to keep it on me at all times in my backpack. That morning, I moved all of that stuff, all of my camera equipment, all of my electronic stuff, all went in my backpack. And so I everything I needed for the wedding and for the rest of the traveling, I still had on me. Wow. Yeah. yeah, you were very, you were very lucky in terms of that and everything. Now you mentioned earlier, and I just want to come to this as well: the fact that society, and particularly, I'm thinking about churches, that Sunday is probably our most segregated hour in terms of race and religion and culture and class and things of that nature. But as I'm thinking about it, and as I'm listening to you talk about these stories, I'm thinking weddings are probably the one time that we let all of that go. Because I'm thinking of like, like I have a friend of mine who is a professor in Greensboro. At uh, UNCG, I think she's still there, or no, Bennett, I think it is. But she's married to a Muslim brother, and they somehow managed to let that uh, religion, um, American Muslim, like the Nation of Islam, I think he might be not Nation of Islam, but the other one, but definitely American Muslim as opposed to the one of those from the Middle East. And then she's definitely raised Christian. And then I've had other friends that are, you know, different age ranges, different um, uh, faith bases, as well as different races, of course. And it seems to me that when they have the weddings, that's the one time that things seem to be different, that they don't, that those uh, biases, yeah, they have to find a way to work the biases into the wedding ceremony, but they find a way to let that, let it happen and both parties be happy. And then a lot of times they find a way to even live happily ever after. I was wondering if you had had some of those kind of uh, projects where you have gone to cross faith or cross racial or um, even across age range kind of weddings because we do sometimes stereotype our people thinking that younger people or older people shouldn't be getting married if there's like a 10 or 15 year gap or whatever. Absolutely. And actually, weirdly, I have some statistics for you on that. Um, um, in, two, in Wedding Wire's nine, 2019 um, newlywed report, they um, did this uh, uh, their, their survey on 18,395 people that answered their survey. 22% of them grew up in different relig- in different regions of the United of the country. 18% of them have different religious beliefs. 17% have different ethnicities. 
and 15% come from different races. So, you know, yeah, you know, that's actually speaking to a lot of what's happening in America right now is, um, is that we are cross-culturing, um, which is really, um, so I bring my, my, my medical knowledge back into the thing. One of the, one of the things that my uh, research doctor, who is very into genetics, made a comment about very early on is that um, the reason that the Ashkenazi Jewish population has so many diseases that, that are uncontrollable is because of the fact that they interbred for so many generations and they never crossbred outside of, outside of their own tribe. And she made a comment that if you want to have healthy children, you should always marry somebody of a completely different cultural background than what you have. Because when you mix those two sets of DNA, you get, you, you get a stronger human being from that than when you stay within the same cultural group. So I thought that was interesting. But, um, yes. Yeah, sorry, I, I divert very easily. Um, no but yes, I've I've done I've done a number of uh, I got a phone call at the last minute a number of years ago when I was still shooting full full time, um, and I got a phone call at the last minute saying, hey, can you possibly come to Michigan or can you? They were from Michigan and they were getting married in Wisconsin. I was still living in Wisconsin at the time. We're getting married on Thanksgiving Day. Any chance that you'd be willing to shoot our wedding? And it was like the week before Thanksgiving. <laughs> um, and I was like, sure. You know, I had, I had no reason not to. You know, I wasn't, going to, I wasn't throwing a Thanksgiving party. So, uh, so I drove to wherever that was, uh, and it was a small wedding, and it was a cross-cultural wedding. Um, and, and they did it in a fireman's hall, and, um, and they crossed. Not only was it cross-cultural, but it was, it was cross-religions also. She was Catholic, he is a, uh, and she's, she's a white girl, and she married a, a African-American man who is Muslim. Um, and, you know, so, so they, did, they did little pieces of the, of the readings from both culture, from both religions. Um, and then, um, but the, the dinner itself was all Thanksgiving. <laughs> you don't get more um you don't get more american um than uh turkey and and cranberries um you know and so it was just it was a really neat little wedding um sounds like it you know i've done catholic jewish weddings um obviously not orthodox jewish but jewish um american jewish yeah you know it happens it happens all the time especially and i think i think this younger generation um, you'll see it even more because I think that the younger generation sees people as people. Yeah, uh, I've got to get one of my other guests. I definitely want you to stay on, though, and everything. But um, I was actually going to agree with you because I've even seen younger generations. Like I said, I'm over here a few years older than you. I'm about to be uh, 50. Well, I just turned 57. And I've seen people that are younger that don't even mind at least having conversations about social outings with people that are, I would say, even 15 or 20 years older than them. I'm not saying they're going to necessarily get involved with them, but they don't mind at least having the social interaction with people that are older than them, and sometimes it might even lead to relationships and things of that nature. And then the other thing that I was going to add is that uh, you're talking about the ways that uh, changes in diseases and society and things of that nature. I've got a friend of mine who's probably pushing near it was, she's actually, I think she's not quite 60, but she's definitely approaching near 60. And she's even dealing with the fact that she's still having women things that go on in terms of the women biology happen to her life now and she's going to her doctor regularly. And then some of it is stuff that has to do with her health and the way that uh, her um, growth and everything and things that happen in her life. But she's you know, you know, still blown away that she's having those things happening to her life as she's pushing near 60 when most people are going into, like, that is that not a concern of theirs. Yeah. Yeah. She could still get pregnant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and she has to be careful about that if she, you know, or she can, if she wants to have a baby, she can, you know, women are having babies in their fifties now, which I think are crazy, but you know, whatever. Um, that's just my point of view. You know I mean? If you want to do that, go for it, but it's, it's a huge health risk, but, um, yes. 
De- you know. Definitely. But but if you were to okay, the last.